Hello and welcome to tonight's performance with the Royal College of Music Symphony Orchestra. My name is Emmanuel Webb, I'm a current student here at the RCM and I'm the leader of tonight's orchestra. During the interval we will hear from Sir Antonio Papano, catch up with tonight's soloists and also hear from RCM students and staff about some of the exciting things happening at the college this spring. First I'm joined here by Sir Antonio Papano. Maestro, thank you very much for joining me. You're very welcome. You've worked with the RCM Symphony Orchestra before, uh, what's it like to be back? You know, to work with younger people for me is I see it as a mission, as a wonderful opportunity for me, first of all, to, to preach a little bit, um, but it's a teaching and passing on information that you've learned from years of experience. This is the moment. These young people are in a co music college and they're getting ready to go out into the real world and to share the information that could be vital to them. That's, so for me, it's a, um, a very, very important opportunity. Now, of course, it's up to each of the young people to listen, to question, and of course, it's my job to challenge them, uh, each and every one of them. And there are a lot of soloists in this concert, a lot of individual people that have to really, really be at the top of their game. So they need encouragement and coaxing and coaching. You know, I'm there to coach also. I'm not purposely avoiding the sport um, metaphor. I think it, there's something of that, you know, it, we're a team we're, we're, and we're training to deliver something. Could you please tell us in a few words um, about the program? Yes, the program is a, a lovely program. Two contemporaries, Richard Strauss and Mahler, and they were completely different, though both of them completely intoxicated uh, with the ideas and the experiments of Richard Wagner. How they came up, the two of them, with completely different solutions to harmony, to texture, to storytelling. Both of them deal very much in autobiography. So though Mahler writes about nature, it's 
Mahler's appreciation of nature. So it's always filtered through him, really. And Mahler always creates, well, he creates obstacles that he has to overcome. He has to be the hero. But as I'm saying this, I can say that Richard Strauss does exactly the same thing in his pieces, Ein Heldenleben, the hero's life. He's the, uh, the hero. So there's, there's a concentration on the ego, complex harmony, the developments of Wagner brought to new heights, the, somehow the slate of hand of a Strauss, the way he can go from one harmony to the next and all of a sudden you're in a different world. It's just, just amazing. If we can touch on the Mahler, which is coming up in the second half, um, even though he discarded his original program notes for the first symphony, in your opinion, you, you've spoken a lot about nature, what do you think is the core of the piece? What is it really about? Well, nature is many things. It's nature is beauty, it's the beginning of things, it's, there's, everything dies or hibernates in winter and to be reborn in the spring. Winter is also tempests and gales and things to overcome, th things that create fear. So there's your drama. A symphony has to portray drama. But most of the piece um, is very human. It, it, there, are, there are dances, there are rustic dances. There's a celebration of the outdoors, of the summer festival, if you like. Dances with kind of heavier shoes. So the second movement is not dum, 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 dum. It's dum, 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 And then this very strange third movement, the kind of the Frere Jacques, starts with a solo double bass. The finale is a, there's your tempest. So you're always in danger of going off the cliff and the piece is, technically quite difficult, and, but very, very dramatic, very operatic mm. almost, huge gestures, very unexpected after, you hear, after hearing the, the rest of the symphony. You have a situation that creates incredible dangers for a human being that have to be overcome. And does the hero overcome? Oh, yes. Yes, so he, I mean, you know, blaze of D major at the end and, and everybody, you know, celebrating the victory. It's a fantastic uh, journey, but you have to go through, you have to go through hell before you get there. Mahler was both a composer and a conductor. Do you think um, the specific markings in the score are a result of his work as a conductor? Well, Mahler was not only a conductor, he was one of the greatest, I mean, meticulous he was, and a great opera conductor too. I think when it came to his music, he was, he, he just wanted to make sure that other interpreters really knew what he wanted, so he was very, very specific. Therefore, he makes the life of the conductor easier. It's conductor's music. I mean, it doesn't make it easier to play for the musicians, but the conductor is given a template with which to work that, that will help him realize a performance that is as close to his ideal as possible. Now, you have to be very, very faithful to those markings. And you cannot ignore the certain Viennese traditions. For instance, in the second movement in the trio, in the Lendler, there's a yum, da, da, da. It's written that way. One, two, and three. Blah. But it's yum, da, 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 yum, da, 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 yum, da, 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 yum. It goes over the bar. Those things, you must, I think you mustn't be shut off to those things. You can't be so literal that you're stuck in a box. But you have to have taken into consideration everything that he's written down for you. And finally, one question from our Instagram followers. What is the piece that you have most enjoyed conducting? That's a very difficult question for me to answer because I tend to throw myself into whatever I'm doing and, and it's got to be the greatest thing ever each time. Each piece has its own rules. Each piece has its own story. Each piece has its own style. But style is not just play with no vibrato or play with vibrato. It's how much vibrato. Why are we playing non-vibrato? That All those things, I think, um, keep me in this job because I'm, I'm curious to answer questions and, and solve 
the riddles of music making, if you like. Maestro, thank you for joining me. You're very welcome. Now, of all the amazing moments that happened in Mahler 1, none brings the bass section such excitement as the opening of the third movement. I'm here with Isabel, who is our principal double bass, um, who will tell us more about it. Uh, it's very unconventional to have a double bass solo in, in a symphony. It's really exciting how the theme, which first starts on the double bass and is actually for jacks, but in a minor key, then moves onto the bassoon and then keeps moving around until it eventually builds up. And it starts very, very exposed. So how do you control your nerves? It's like a scary it's, moment, no? It's really scary because it's a very known um, piece of music. So if you know the symphony, you know what's coming up. And people are expecting the solo. And the previous movement, it ends like really fortissimo. And then out of an hour, it's just complete silence. And all you hear is a timpani going, dun, dun, dun. And you're like, oh, oh it's my moment. Uh, Isabel, thank you very much. I look forward to hearing it in the concert. Thank you so much. I'm now joined by Meline and Francis, our soloists for the Strauss Jewett Concertina, which opened this concert tonight. They also won the RCM's Concerto competition. Welcome to you both. Meline, can you please give me some insight into the piece? Yes, it's a wonderful piece for clarinet, bassoon, string orchestra and harp. Uh, it's in three movements which run into each other. Um, and um, it's basically the Beauty and the Beast story. <laughs> <laughs> and I am the princess and uh, Francis is the Beast. Of uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> very elegant one, um, uh, transforming into a charming prince. So is that the story that you take with you through the journey of this piece, The Beauty and the Beast? I think so. Well, it starts with a stunning clarinet solo that sort of lasts for quite a long time and it really sets the scene. And then I interrupt with something quite sort of growly and grovelly underneath. And our f the first movement is almost us sort of slightly competing, slightly duelling, I suppose, um, and with some beautiful lines in both parts, but it's always almost slightly unsettled. And then there's an extraordinary um, transformation um, both uh, melodically and harmonically into the second movement um, with this sort of shimmer in the high strings and harp. Very um, floaty atmosphere. Mm, yeah, and then the bassoon comes in with, I think, one of the most beautiful um, lines ever written for the instrument in all music. It really, really is stunning. And so I think at that point, the, the beast has transformed into somewhat of a prince. <laughs> and I know you had some one-on-one -on -one time with Maestro Papano. What was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, to work with someone like that is pretty extraordinary. Um, and he just oozes musicality, ideas, presence, yeah. He's an opera conductor, not only, but we can feel um, he really knows which atmospheres he wants for uh, every uh, part of the piece. And it's fantastic, just it's really inspiring. Amazing. And as I'm sure everyone at home is dying to know, where can we see you next? Do you have any exciting projects coming up? <laughs> we do. Together, yes. <laughs> next week, actually. Yes, next Saturday, we're doing a performance, another um, ensemble concerto piece, this time Mozart's Sinfonia Concertante. Francis, I know you're taking part in the inaugural double read day here at the college. Can you tell us a little bit about I that? Am. Yes, I'm back again at college on Sunday morning um, for our first ever uh, double read day, as you say, and um, where we are celebrating the oboe and the bassoon. And we've got master classes from some of the top players and professors. I'm taking part as I'm helping to lead a couple of workshops for younger bassoonists. So various different bassoons from across the country are coming along and we're going to be doing some chamber music, some coaching, uh, sort of lots of playing and, and getting to know each other. Fantastic. Thank you both for coming and having a chat. I'm now here with our superstar soprano, Madeline Borum, who we just heard singing four of Strauss's most beautiful songs for voice and orchestra. Thank you for coming up here. Um, can you please talk us through the songs a little bit, what you just sang and what they're about? Absolutely. So these four pieces are all individual tales on um, a story of love. The first being a message to a loved one to open up and be with me in a dark spot where people might not see us. Um, we then have Das Rosenband, which is similar in a way as I surround my loved one with a garland of roses and when they wake up we lay eyes on each other and fall madly in love. 
We've got Point Lita Vision, which is yet another story about walking through a beautiful field full of dandelions and daisies um, to a place where we were meant to be together. And finally, we have Libus Hymnus, which is a, a message to, to the world, talking about the joy of love and hailing to my loved one for the beauty and for who they are and what they've done to me. So how does Strauss connect the music to the text? Um, I think Strauss is one of the greatest composers for voice and I think everything he does, he does on purpose. And I think one moment for me that I think stands out is in Das Wurzenband. The final phrase that I sing ends with the word Elysium, which means paradise. And it is the only moment of melisma that I get within these four songs where he uses triplets and semiquaver movements to really flow into the feel of a paradise. And every time I sing it, I feel like like it's so easy to get swept up into that that beautiful image of Elysium of paradise. Wonderful and Strauss wrote originally these four songs for voice and piano and then orchestrated only three of them the fourth stanchion is orchestrated by Mottl as so, a do you think he captures the essence of Strauss? Is it the same for you to sing? I think it's always um, a very different beast when singing any of Strauss's pieces with an orchestra. I think um, Stenschen is a notoriously fiddly piece on the piano. And I think it's easier with piano to take it at a faster speed and really play with these tempi. I think it's a different thing with orchestra because obviously there are more players and more tricky things to be done on each individual instrument instrument. So it's been a little bit of a learning curve for me to perform this piece with orchestra, not only for the tempi, but also for the dynamics and in making sure that I'm always heard over the orchestra, but I also still capture the beauty of Strauss's music. Can you tell us about any exciting projects you have coming up? Absolutely. So we're doing uh, The Merry Widow um, at the RCM this term, and I will be playing the role of Valenciennes, who is a very fun character. She, um, she has something going on with one of the men um, around, and there's a lot of playing around and also a lot of waltzing to be done. So I'm really looking forward to performing that role. It's the first time I'll be doing it. And yeah, I think it's going to be a great production, and we'll be getting into rehearsals soon. So it should be great fun. That's it. Maddie, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I'm now joined by three of my colleagues from the RCM Symphony Orchestra. We get so many fantastic opportunities here at the RCM, be it through masterclasses or working with wonderful guest conductors, but there's one specific type of opportunity that unites us all here, which is the chance to play on the orchestral schemes. Um, I'm playing on the BBC scheme myself at the moment, and Emily, you are on the... I'm on the RPO and the ENO scheme. Fantastic, and Daniel? I'm on the ENO Evolve scheme. And Vanessa? I'm on the LSO Strong Experience scheme. Can you tell me a bit about the selection process? Uh, well, it starts with uh, RCM orchestral auditions at the beginning of every year. Certain students are selected to go forward for the orchestral schemes. Uh, Emily, you're on the RPO scheme. Was the selection process different to the ENO scheme? Yes, yeah, so it was quite different. Um, we did a screened audition and had to play a few excerpts and some Mozart. And then the second round was playing actually within the section, so it was a really enjoyable experience. With the LSO scheme, what was that like? So with the LSO string experience, first you do the general audition in college in the beginning of the year, then college nominates a couple of um, string players who then go on and audition against nominated people from the other conservators. And then two violists get selected um, to do this scheme. And um, both violists were from college this year, am I correct? Oh yeah, both the violists this year are from college. Daniel, I know you got the opportunity to go into the pit. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that and what you took from that experience? Well, it was very exciting to rehearse with the professionals in the first place. Most of the rehearsals took place not in the Coliseum, but actually in other halls around London. But then I had the opportunity to play alongside the professionals in the pit and um, it was very different to what I'm used to doing. It was just enjoyable and it makes you want to watch opera as well. What was your most enjoyable experience on the scheme so far? Or what are you most looking forward to? Um, I really enjoyed playing Traviata last term. Uh, it's the most beautiful music. Um, and also Ieno gave us comp tickets to go and watch uh, the rehearsals. So it was really, really beautiful. And Vanessa, what are you most looking forward to with the LSO? I'm really looking forward to playing with Sir Simon Rattle, as well as with Sir Antonio Papano again, and also I think we're playing with Isabel Faust, which I'm particularly excited about. 
thank you all very much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you all later for the performance. I'm sure you'll agree that we've had some fantastic guests. Before I let you go back to the hall for the second half of the concert, we will hear from Flo Ambrose, who is going to tell us more about the exciting things happening later this season. Hello, I'm Flo Ambrose. I'm the Head of Performance Programming and Faculties at the College. Tonight's concert is just one of 166 events that we've got happening this term, some of which are live streamed, others take place in our building and some take place at uh, other venues close to the College. So each term we do several symphony orchestra concerts. Uh, the next one that we'll be doing, which will be live streamed, will be conducted by Hawken Hardenberger. And Hawken will also be playing his trumpet in that concert. There's a couple of contemporary trumpet concertos and then he'll be conducting Mazorski's pictures at an exhibition. Our two Philharmonic concerts this term will be conducted by Chloe Van Soetersted and Natalia Luis Basser. Uh, and they are conducting Samson's Organ Symphony and Haydn's Symphony 100, respectively. As part of our events programme, we hold orchestral concerts, ensemble concerts, chamber music and masterclasses. So this term we have our chamber festival coming up on the 10th and 11th of February. Um, we have two days of concerts featuring string quartets, wind ensembles, brass ensembles, piano trios, uh, percussion and all sorts of different ensembles, including pop-ups in the cafe. Most of our masterclasses are open to the public um, and it's an opportunity to come in and see visiting artists working with our students. So highlights this term include Dame Inogen Cooper on piano, we've got Alison Balsam on trumpet and Sasha Romero on trombone. Other highlights this term include our Baroque Orchestra who perform with our Chamber Choir in a series of Bach cantatas. They're performing both here at the College and a concert in Oxford as well. On Thursday the 7th of March we perform Vorjak's 8th Symphony with members of the Chamber Orchestra of Europe sitting in the orchestra amongst our students. This concert will also be live streamed. This term the wind ensemble, the brass ensemble and percussion ensemble all perform. The percussion ensemble is a great opportunity for people who haven't come to the college before to come in and watch them perform. It's a great performance where they use all sorts of different instruments. As part of our performance programme we also perform at concert halls in and around London. And on the 1st of May, we're performing Messian's Tarangalila Symphony at the Royal Festival Hall. All the details for our performances can be found in our events guide and online. Tickets can be booked via our box office and online. And we hope to see you at one of our events soon.
Thank <laughs> you.